Welcome to the Make Ready with the Experts podcast. I'm your host, Fernando Coelho. We're here at Pantio Studios bringing you the very best from in and around the firearms industry, covering topics like guns, gear, firearms training, self-defense, and so much more. Everything from industry insights about the latest gear and training techniques, to hunting, survival, and empty hands. But this isn't just about the guns, folks. This is about the stories, the military, law enforcement, and civilian stories of heroics protecting our country, fellow citizens, friends, and neighbors. MakeReady.tv is the official website of Pantio Productions and features over 5,000 segments from world-famous instructors. With new video titles added each month, MakeReady.tv is widely known as the Netflix of firearms training. However, we really do go beyond that. We have survival series. We have empty hands. We have edged weapons. We cover armorer skills. We've done documentaries, even medical and hunting. With your subscription, you will have access to an extensive library of videos. To be quite honest, we got a lot. Be sure to visit MakeReady.tv and subscribe today to stream our exclusive content to any device, anywhere, anytime. This is content that just may save your life or the life of someone you love. In the Make Ready podcast, we're going to be including some special episodes really special editions of content that we feel would be a great fit for our listeners. For example, we have the Gunsight 40th anniversary video that we filmed a few years back. It was a wealth of information about Gunsight Academy, specifically the history of Colonel Jeff Cooper. If something is coming up your line of sight, trying to tear your head off, you don't think about how it's gonna hurt, you think about curtain control. You concentrate on the things you must concentrate on, and everything else you blank out. Now I know some of you are probably wondering, well, who is Jeff Cooper and what is Gunsight? <sighs> okay, just think of it like this. Everything has to start somewhere. And when it comes to pistol craft, when it comes to concealed carry and defending yourself with a handgun, it honestly really did all start with Jeff Cooper. He's considered the founder of modern pistol craft. If you go to Gunsight, you're at an institution that is over 40 years old. In fact, Gunsight was started in 1976, and back then it was pretty much the only game in town. Many instructors today owe their debt to Colonel Cooper. In fact, most techniques today can be based in what Jeff Cooper taught. So when you're asking yourself, who's Jeff Cooper? All right, do one thing for me. Go to the mirror, take your hand, smack yourself, then go to Google and look up Jeff Cooper or just watch our entire video and you'll know all you need to know. I think it is an absolute truth that man fights with his mind. His weapons are simply the extension of his will. If you get into a fight, you will win it with your mind. We're at Gunside Academy in Paulden, Arizona. The mindset is what sets Gunside apart from so many schools. This is where it all began. This is the meat and potatoes of what we have to offer at Gunsight. Gunsight was the first school to offer weapons training, defensive training, to the general population. Press, hold! Hammer pair. Welcome to Gunsight Academy. One of the big things we do here at Gunsight is to teach different phases of training. We can start with basic firearms course. In other words, the bullet goes in here, it comes out here, here's how you load your magazine, here's how you put it in the gun. From there you go to tactics-based classes. In 
Gunsight's been known for its instructors, and I can see Gunsight continuing to evolve and grow. The location is pretty much spectacular. It's just a camaraderie of like-minded people. It's a family unit. The name Jeff Cooper has for years been synonymous with teaching the modern use of firearms. Get some, yeah, yeah, get some pressure in there. You don't have to do that, you can leave it out. Jeff was considered the world's foremost authority on defensive weapon craft, teaching what he called the modern technique of the pistol at the school he founded, American Pistol Institute. Shots below in the head are not very satisfactory. They may be pretty uh, unpleasant for the person hit, but they don't stop him. Now, if he's still there, if he's still shooting, if he's still deadly, if he's still trying to get you, hit him here. That's great. Jeff went beyond the technical aspects of shooting and incorporated mental conditioning and established a set of firearm safety rules that continue to be used today. One, all guns are always loaded. Two, never let the muzzle cover anything which you're not willing to destroy. Three, keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on target. Four, Always be sure of your target. American Pistol Institute, or API as it was known, grew to become Gunsight. The first person we're gonna hear from is Mrs. Janelle Cooper. We were both living in Los Angeles, California, and we both were attending Los Angeles High School. He was ahead of me uh, a half year, but that gets kind of complicated, so we won't go into that, but uh, he went to, uh, on up to uh, Stanford and was a full year ahead of me then. But uh, we met in high school and uh, we were uh, a blind date. It used to be called, I don't know what to call them now, but I hate to think, uh, blind date because uh, my, uh, best friend and his best friend thought that we should we should meet and we probably would get along very well and indeed we did that's when things became uh, more serious uh, I was in a class of uh, three to one three men to one woman at Stanford at that time and uh, I was having an awfully good time and uh, didn't wish to uh, think serious thoughts like getting uh, pinned down and uh, so on. And uh, so for the first couple of years, why uh, we, uh, we went on dates and it was later on that uh, I realized that uh, uh, he, he, was, he was the one for me. And, it's much nicer when you've kind of looked over the field and then you've made up your mind that uh, you, uh, you've you made the best choice. Uh, that I think it's, it's uh, I think I was fortunate that I could do that. Because the Marine Corps trains each and every one of them individually, gives each confidence in himself and in all other Marines. He got an honor graduate commission in the Marine Corps because he had taken ROTC all through high school. And uh, he uh, went back to uh, basic school and then Pearl Harbor happened and that was while I was a senior at uh, Stanford. I went on living in my uh, sorority house uh, Jeff's class uh, was hastily graduated because of the confusion after Pearl Harbor. You can imagine our country being attacked and all of a sudden everybody had to think about his role in a war, a real honest to God declared war, so. History that 130 million Americans will never forget. And in days to come, the Japs too will remember Pearl Harbor. 
Here is a tragic, unforgettable page in the annals of America. Here the cunning deceit of the Japs will never be forgotten. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Okay, now think about this for a moment. You got a girlfriend, you're in school, you're dating, you're having a good time, and all of a sudden now, the country is plunged into war. Now, that means a little, that, that has a different connotation nowadays with social media, with Instagram, YouTube, everything is at your fingertips. I mean, everything. You know about stuff before other people know about it. Now, let's go back in time a little bit. No television, just radio, newspaper. Even a phone in your house was a luxury and an option. And all of a sudden now, you find out December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor is attacked by the Japanese. I mean, just think about that. It wasn't on Google. It wasn't on Fox News. It wasn't on Twitter. You just found out about this. And now you're, we're at war. And what do you do? You fight for your country. He... Uh was the Marine Corps uh, attached him to the uh, battleship Pennsylvania, which had been uh, d uh, injured in uh, at Pearl Harbor, but not not destroyed. So it went in for repairs. He was attached to it, but uh, he was more or less free uh, because the ship was not uh, mobile, not underway. And uh, so we got the bright idea that uh, we didn't know what the future held for us and maybe we should get married. And uh, so uh, we eloped. And uh, in February, one uh, weekend, we started out in his uh, station wagon to drive to Nevada where we wouldn't have a long waiting period. In Nevada, you could get your license and get married right away, whereas California, you had to wait several days. And we didn't have that kind of time. So on the way over, we were going over Donner Pass, over the Sierra Nevadas. And those of you who have heard of Donner Pass, it's where the Donner Party died uh, of a blizzard, and uh, we encountered a blizzard. Donner Pass got its name, by the way, from a party of pioneers who were stopped here a hundred years ago by blizzards. There were no diesel trains to come to their rescue, and many perished from cold and starvation. Donner Pass. Why is this important? For the history buffs out there, you know. For those that only know their phone and Instagram, we'll give you a little bit of a lesson. In early November of 1846, the Donner Party were going with their wagons over the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Now, think about this. Heavy snow, the mountains, wagons, no roads, no GPS, no one around, no state troopers around. It is just these folks, these settlers. They found themselves in probably the worst scenario possible. Out of 81 settlers, only 45 of them managed to make it to California. And for those 45 to make it to California, there were heavy rumors of some serious cannibalism going on for them to survive. So thankfully for Jeff and his wife, none of that happened. Jeff was in his uh, Marine Corps wool uniform with a, with a nice wool overcoat on. I had on a fur coat, but I had high heels, so I wasn't very practical in walking. And uh, we sort of sat there for a little while with the snow piling up, wondering what was gonna happen next. Well, miracle. A, uh, an army reconnaissance vehicle came plowing through the snow, looking for stranded uh, uh, travelers, picked us up, and took us to the nearest town and in effect saved our lives. Uh, I can't think of any other 
way that we could have uh, survived that. It was a quarter of midnight when we finally got the Reverend Grimshaw to get out of bed and come in. <laughs> and that was in uh, uh, Gardnerville, uh, Nevada. So we were married and uh, then the chauffeur drove us back to uh, uh, Reno and uh, to, uh, to the hotel there. So that was our, our marriage. A uh, little, little different from the usual marriage, you might say, but uh, I think it was the uh, promise of a, of a very exciting life to come with lots of good luck. <laughs> got to admit, that's a pretty cool story. They got together, went off, got married. His wife now goes back to Stanford University to school, and Jeff Cooper goes off to war. I mean, movies are made of this stuff. Uh, so that, uh, that was uh, the, uh, the beginning of a uh, 74 years of marriage. <laughs> Our streaming video subscribers of MakeReady.tv will now get exclusive access to the video versions of our podcasts. In addition, subscribers will have access to our episodes before they air on iTunes or any other free platform. Be sure to visit MakeReady.tv and subscribe today to stream our exclusive content to any device, anywhere, anytime. Aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay on Sunday, September the 2nd, 1945, the most horrible war in history came to its complete and formal end. During the war, of course, uh, the war was from 1941 to 1945. Uh, at that time, I was living in Los Angeles with my mother, and uh, our first child was born, uh, a, a daughter, and um, Jeff was uh, in the Pacific, the USS Pennsylvania was in, it was the uh, later declared the busiest battleship of World War II in that uh, it uh, was in on almost all of the landings in the various islands that were being uh, taken uh, where uh, the uh, so many of the Marines that went ashore were killed, and uh, he wanted to be a, uh, a line officer. Uh, it didn't appeal to him to be uh, uh, on a battleship. Uh, he said if I'd wanted to uh, go to sea, I would have joined the Navy. But uh, you go where they tell you, uh, <laughs> of course. Hiroshima got one small atomic bomb, and 60% of it was wiped out. And I, I do want to point out uh, that uh, the atom bomb uh, was a blessing for everybody, including the Japanese, because uh, there would have been many, 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 many more fatalities if it hadn't been for the atom bomb ending the war. And I, I just throw that in because uh, it's uh, I hear now around the edges that... Uh, uh, the uh, United States is being criticized for for the atom bomb, but believe me, it was it was the answer. So here we are. Two bombs dropped. Finally, the war is over. Peace treaty signed. Soldiers are rejoicing. Soldiers are heading home. Washington is jubilant. And in Chicago, more than a million sing and dance in the streets in the biggest celebration the Windy City has ever seen. Joy is unconfined. Finally, uh, came home aboard his, uh, his battleship and uh, so we had uh, some time together. He was uh, stationed, uh, uh, attached to uh, Pendleton, uh, right there in California, which was convenient for us. And 
We lived in a uh, rented beach house in San Clemente for a while, and uh, he uh, caught the attention of the commanding general there at uh, uh, Pendleton and was sent back to command and staff school, which was a jump up in his career. So uh, we had to pack up and move back to Quantico, Virginia. And uh, believe me, moving from Southern California to Virginia when I had never been out of the state almost ever in my whole life was quite a, quite a change. <laughs> Just like in modern times today, soldiers come home to what? Getting back into the regular grind, getting a job, getting back into life. And for Jeff Cooper, it was pretty much the same thing. What was going to be Jeff's next step? But uh, we lived on uh, quarters on, at uh, Quantico while Jeff attended command and staff school again. He caught the attention of the uh, staff at the school and was asked to stay aboard as an instructor. So he stayed on and uh, he had a particular topic, which was the Battle of Gallipoli, that he studied, got his training aides together, and would get up on the stage and give his uh, rendition of the Battle of Gallipoli with the, with the AIDS. And he would get standing ovations from the audience, and the audience was composed of uh, uh, majors and lieutenant colonels and colonels and generals and so on. This lecture early on in Jeff Cooper's career was really the turning point. It was proof, at least to Jeff, that he was an orator. He could, he could get in front of a, a group of people and mesmerize them with what he had to say. And years down the road, from API to gun sight, that's exactly what he did. He was recognized early on for his uh, ability to uh, be on the podium and to uh, uh, put across uh, uh, his, his ideas and so on. Uh, in as a lecturer and i think that's one reason why gunsight is was so successful was uh, jeff's uh, ability uh up on the stage to to put across uh what he was uh trying to uh, trying to teach you've got to think properly You've got to ex expel from your mind all conditions other than the ones you know you must think about. If something is coming up to your line of sight, trying to tear your head off, you don't think about how it's going to hurt, you think about trigger control. You concentrate on the things you must concentrate on and everything else you blank out. You can't be afraid if you're thinking about what you're doing. So you have to be able to control your mind that way to, to the degree that you can destroy all objections, all uh, obtruding thoughts, and think only about the problem of hand which is hitting what you're shooting at. In Jeff's quest for self-discovery, one thing that he did learn, he was a master teacher. He got his uh, idea, shall we say, uh, his interest in the best handling of the force, he carried a 45 automatic as a Marine officer. And uh, the uh, FBI Academy had its school, uh, its training uh, right down below our quarters. And so the uh, range was so close, he audited the FBI course and uh, became more and more interested in teaching a uh, pistol. He uh, slipped on the ice, and my daughter reminded me that he had uh, our, our second daughter <laughs> in, his, in his arm when, when he slipped on the ice, 
here we are in Virginia, you know where they have, we have winters, unlike Southern California. And uh, he put his arm, straight arm down like that and just smashed his elbow is what he did. So when you read about it being his shoulder, uh-uh, it was his elbow. I throw that in because there's a big, <laughs> big to-do going on about whether it was Jeff's shoulder or his elbow or his whatever as if it made any difference. But in recuperating and in the uh, physical therapy that was required to recover from this injury, uh, he uh, became very interested in uh, drawing from a holster and uh, in connection with teaching pistol. That is of interest to people who like to quibble about how the modern technique came about and uh, the uh, uh, weaver stance, how it came about. But maybe we don't want to go into that, I don't know. The technique we're going to teach here this week is uh, one that has been developed over a long period, about 30 years. And while we call it now the modern technique of the pistol, it isn't all that modern anymore. There are a lot of people who think that anything that's two years old is obsolete. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, the modern technique of the pistol is what we call it. We'll keep on calling it that. It's almost safe to say that the early steps of the modern technique of the pistol can be attributed to this little mishap when, he, when Jeff Cooper fell. I mean, from there, maybe it was the wheel started turning and maybe it was through his uh, recuperation. Um, it, it, it's, it's safe to say that that could have been the starting point in his mind. Those wheels started turning and the modern technique was, was being founded. So they put him on an admiral's staff and sent him to uh, San Diego, California. And of course the move to San Diego was just fine with us. That was closer to, closer to home and uh, so on. But it, it, Jeff was a Marine, not, not a naval officer, and uh, that did not set well with him. And so he uh, did not serve very long on this Admiral's staff before he decided to separate himself from the Marine Corps. Uh, we were in Los Angeles, uh, and he was kind of looking around, trying to cope with that very difficult situation that a military man has when he becomes a civilian. And he uh, didn't, didn't find a ready slot. His, his uh, father, who was a vice president of a bank, would have liked for him to go into banking, but that didn't appeal to him in the least. And I remember there was one uh, unhappy period where he was trying to sell life insurance. That was not for Jeff, selling life insurance. And uh, so he, although in a way he ended up selling life insurance, <laughs> didn't he? I never thought of that before. <laughs> but it was a different, different, way, different kind of an insurance policy that he was involved with later on with uh, figuring out how to uh, defend yourself with a small arm. But keep in mind that marksmanship is only part of the exercise. Marksmanship can be established by your ability to hit targets, paper targets, or steel targets. Uh, but that's not what wins a fight. It's a combination of the ability to use your weapon well and uh, to be willing to use it when you have to. We moved up to 7,000 feet in the San Bernardino Mountains to Big Bear Lake, California, where my grandfather had uh, pioneered and my family had uh, uh, acre, some acreage up there, 40 acres up there. And uh, so he began to uh, establish himself in the uh, sports car racing field. That was a period in his life that he started when he was uh, living in Washington and became uh, enchanted by the thought of 
uh, driving a sports car. It was the Sports Car Club of America that was just starting out, and he would he would uh, he would race, uh, even though he was uh, six two and about 180 pounds. Uh, he couldn't uh, think seriously about being going into it as, uh, shall we say, a vocation. Uh, so it was just around the edges, but he loved to go fast and uh, without getting arrested. <laughs> now to put things in perspective, before gun sight, before API, before the modern technique of the pistol, Jeff Cooper was dabbling in racing. Now for a timeline of, of history, this was around the same time that Carroll Shelby was out there racing cars. This is before the Carroll Shelby with Mustangs and Carroll Shelby with Ford versus Ferrari. We're talking about the early days here, but it's interesting to note that when Jeff Cooper was racing, Carroll Shelby was racing. When Carroll Shelby was being noted in magazines like Sports Cars Illustrated and Road and Track, Jeff Cooper was actually writing for Sports Cars Annual and Road and Track. So there was a lot of correlation uh, of those two individuals uh, along the same timeline. My name's Carol Shelby and performance is my business. The sport car circuits with their constantly changing conditions offer the challenge, the kicks I was after. He uh, became involved in the uh, building of a big uh, sports car racing circuit in uh, Southern California, and he was called in to be a consultant on uh, what kind of a track to build and how many curves and how many straights and so on. In the meantime, he got picked up by uh, uh, Peterson Publications and also uh, Road and Track Magazine. He was writing for them about racing, and uh, he came in second in a national uh, race that got, gave him some uh, credibility, shall we say, as far as uh, writing about that. And in the process of writing for uh, Peterson Publications, uh, he sort of eased over into uh, the uh, firearms uh, and guns and ammo, uh, because he, again, became interested in the best way to defend oneself uh, with a small arm. And he was able to put on shooting matches up in Big Bear Lake because uh, it was a perfect place. Uh, there was no, no one was alarmed at the thought of people shooting. <laughs> and then in connection, uh, Jeff came up with the uh, leather slap. Now, let's put the leather slap in perspective. There was no IDPA, no GSSF, no USPSA, no IPSC, heck, no bowling pin matches. There's really nothing out there like you're accustomed to today. No steel challenge, no Bianchi Cup, none of this. But what you had was a holster on your hip and you drew your gun from the holster and engaged a target. And it was you against other individuals against the clock. In the process of getting ready for the leather slap, these clubs formed and uh, the, the uh, club in Big Bear Lake was called the Gunslingers. And of course, Jeff was uh, the president and so on. And so, uh, putting on matches, all right, that became his passion, was uh, finding the best way uh, to defend oneself. And that uh, was a big, broad, subject. It was not just how to win the match. and It was uh, it encompassed uh, a man's own ability 
to uh, be self-sufficient in life and to protect himself and his family. But the first year, uh, uh, we had all the old-time big shots were there. Jack Weaver showed up, and Jack was a deputy sheriff at the time, and he observed that nobody was hitting anything, and he went back and thought about it. And he came back the uh, next year with uh, a new system. Because uh, California was becoming more and more restrictive in many ways, uh, we won't go into the politics but uh, of what was happening, but uh, uh, it was uh, obvious that Jeff needed a place to teach. The Gun Control Act of 1968 just passed by the Congress and signed into law by the President grants possessors of certain types of firearms 30 days of grace in order to register these weapons. To avoid criminal prosecution for unlawful possession of these weapons and destructive devices, they must be registered with the Director of Alcohol and Tobacco Tax Division, Washington, D.C. Failure to comply with the results in criminal prosecution punishable by a fine of up to $10,000 or imprisonment of up to 10 years. He had people coming to him and asking, please, would you show me how? You, you have studied this and uh, you have these techniques that you've been writing about in Guns and Ammo magazine, and uh, I want to be taught. So he realized there was a big audience out there and they needed a teacher, so he needed a school. This segment is brought to you by Walther Arms, one of our key supporters and manufacturer of some excellent, excellent kit. If you want to save 20% off some Walther Arms clothing, visit shop.waltherarms.com and use promo code MAKEREADY during checkout. Gunsight was founded by Jeff Cooper as the American Pistol Institute in 1976 in order to teach the modern technique of shooting. The facility was established in Paulden, Arizona on a large tract of land perfect for firearms training. Jeff moved to the property and began constructing shooting bays and teaching students. His lectures were held right on the porch of his home. After the introduction of the rifle and shotgun courses, the school's name was changed from American Pistol Institute to Gunsight. We've had a surprising number of clergymen. I mean, it surprises some people. Uh, a clergyman feels just as concerned about his own life and limb and that of his wife and his child and his house as anyone else. Uh, Arizona was uh, the place, uh, gun-friendly, we're getting out of California and all of its restrictions. And uh, so we came, moved over here in 1975 from Big Bear Lake. I have done a lot of wandering in the woods, but I didn't have the feeling of being the patron that I have here. But um, it does give you a kind of a nice feeling to go to bed at night, close the door and figure the only thing that can get you is the government. The firearms uh, laws and the general ambiente, the, the vibes in Arizona are better for a shooter than they are anywhere else in the United States. We're very fortunate to find uh, an area that had just opened up. It came for sale and um, we, we couldn't pick up a lot of land. We picked up 60 acres and started Gunsight and that was uh, the beginning in 1975 and in 1976 the first class was in October, and that's what uh, Gunsight is uh, celebrating this year, 40 years. So now Jeff Cooper's plans are in motion. Gunsight, the property, Gunsight, the school, the range, everything is, is happening as he, as he wanted. But as with any good plan, you need a support team to help make your vision grow and expand. Enter Robbie Barkman. When I was living in South Africa, we used to read about him. And we decided to 
contact Jeff and see if we could bring him to South Africa to teach some classes there. We were just getting into the practical pistol thing. It was brand new. This was back in the early 70s, 1970s, not the 1870s. And um, we wrote to Jeff and he wrote back and said, absolutely, I'd love to come out there. And so my relationship with Jeff started in 1973. And then, of course, in 1976, they opened the school. And I came over in April of 1977 to take a class and ended up helping him teach the class. And in fact, as far as I know, I have the very first instructor certificate ever issued at Gunsight. So, um, and Jeff and I just became very good friends. And he'd come out to South Africa because he came out three times. He would always stay with us. And so we just became good friends. I first heard about Gunsight back in the middle 70s, probably right when, when Jeff moved over here from Big Bear, California. That was Buzz Mills, the current owner of Gunsight Academy. We'll get into more about Buzz later, but let's just say he saved Gunsight. Uh, it, it was an, amongst the competitive shooting community. It, it was a um, high level of interest. Everybody talked about it. I learned about Gunsight uh, Probably, uh, I'd have to say in Guns and Ammo magazine on the back page, Cooper's Commentaries, uh, where Jeff Cooper wrote every month, and, and it was the way he wrote uh, really caught your attention. It was just little snippets. That was Ken Campbell, a good friend, former sheriff from Indiana, and now CEO of Gunsight. Uh, whether it was about scout rifles or shotguns or 1911 pistols or the history of the Baker flag, the range flag, um, that, that really caught my attention. I was a young deputy at the time, I was a firearms instructor, uh, and, and I was blessed with a good sheriff uh, that wanted to send us to school. So I'd been to Ray Chapman and Masada Yub, uh, Smith & Wesson Academy, uh, and so on, and I, uh, Gunsight was on my radar then because of, of the writings of Jeff Cooper. This is not a toy, this is a serious business. And it uh, is literally a matter of life and death, and preferably his, not yours. When I first heard that there, there was going to be a public gun training school out in Arizona, I was a 21-year-old cadet in the basic police academy. And that was Dave Spaulding, former gun sight student, law enforcement officer, gun writer, and today, firearms instructor. And uh, I can remember thinking that that was a pretty neat idea. The pistol is a means of stopping a fight that somebody else starts. It's a means of turning somebody off who's trying to kill you. <clears throat> in practically every case in which you will have to use a pistol for serious work, it will be because somebody is trying to kill you. And if he's trying to kill you, it is to your advantage to make him stop. And that is what we're talking about. For those of you that have been to Gunsight, as you drive up the, the long driveway, as you go through the entrance, there is a logo there at the top of the entrance, a raven. And if you look at any of the uh, literature from Gunsight, it's the raven. It seemed to us that we would go over the state line out of California into Arizona, we immediately would be greeted by ravens. They would come flying by, and uh, we didn't seem to see, the, see them in California, but we did in Arizona. And when we picked this land, the ravens were here. Uh, they have always been here, and I hope always will be. Uh, the raven was a totem for the Vikings, and so it was determined that one of the ancestors in my mother's family uh, was, was a Viking, and uh, that, uh, so that association was all Jeff needed to kind of emphasize that and build on it. So there was that connection, as well as the actual presence of the birds. Look, breath, and down. Lovely, isn't that pretty? The original buildings were named after books of the Bible. 
The small office building where Colonel Cooper's secretary worked was called Matthew. Uh, the barn was called Mark. The office in the store was called Luke. And the bathrooms were called John. When it came to Jeff Cooper, there were different perspectives or different thoughts on the man, who he was, how he carried himself. Um, it's safe to say he was a confident man. He was a leader. Another writer uh, named Mike Boyle and I had the opportunity to go over and meet Jeff Cooper. He invited us into his home, gave us a tour of the sconce, and uh, I came to realize very quickly that I hoped that I never had to assault that place or raid it because it has to be one of the most secure residences I have ever seen, a true tactical house. Colonel Cooper treated us like gold. We stayed with him for four or five hours and he talked and he gave us his philosophy on things and was very friendly. <laughs> I probably made my only mistake the whole afternoon is when he was standing over at the counter and he was putting one of his guns back, I said, Colonel Cooper, what do you think of the 40 S&W? And he like froze. And he looks at me and he says, sir, I see no purpose. We have the 45 ACP. And I merely nodded my head, but I think back now it's one of my favorite stories because he pretty much told me exactly how he felt about the whole subject matter at hand. He was someone that knew what he wanted in life and was going to achieve it. Okay, I met Jeff in South Africa, obviously the first time when we brought him out. I went to pick him up at the airport. And um, he was a very imposing man. I mean, Jeff Cooper was uh, an exceptional person. He had a presence about him. Uh, you know, just watching him walk off the plane, you could tell this guy was in charge. I mean, he was the boss. Paranoia is a mental aberration, a disease of the mind, characterized by delusions of persecution. Well, I am under no delusions about being persecuted. I am not being persecuted, but I am certainly aware that people do run into conflict all the time. Now, I am probably safer here than I, anyone in the world. However, uh, I am certainly aware that the world is a dangerous place, and I have been teaching people how to meet that challenge, and that challenge is not a delusion. It's there. And very confident, self-confident, extremely well-educated, and um, very willing to share information. But most of all, Jeff was a consummate teacher. He was not an instructor. People keep calling him an instructor, and he was not an instructor, he was a teacher, and there's a big difference. And Jeff was a teacher, because he could explain why you were doing things. He didn't just do it because he was told to give you those instructions. When Jeff was on duty as a range master during the day, he was very much Jeff C Cooper, Colonel Cooper and a very professorial and directive and complete control of everything. And it was, uh, it was great fun watching him because it was almost like gunsight theater. Bob Young was one of the instructors from the early days, and as with other instructors from that era, had an opportunity to spend a lot of quality time with Jeff Cooper at the Sconce. Going through the, the, the classes, then uh, later on that year, in about October, I got a call from Jeff saying that they were going to expand uh, the instructional base and asking if I would be interested in coming back up and going through what we called at the time the provost program. But then after a, a few years of coming up here and getting to know Jeff and Janelle much better, that at the end of the day, we'd go over there and I'd be down in the gun room or we'd be sitting out on the, uh, on the back patio and having a beer and just sitting there talking with Jeff. And occasionally Janelle would come out and we would sit there and they would tell me stories about uh, going to Stanford, growing up in the LA area. And then I began to realize, okay, there are two Jeff Coopers. There is Colonel Cooper, which Jeff has a switch in the back of his head, which I know is there, but I never actually saw it, that he can flip and turn into Colonel Cooper. But then uh, equally so at the end of the day when the students aren't around and it's just a, a handful of staff and Janelle, then he'll hit that switch and turn it into Jeff Cooper. And we could sit and talk about wine or books or just about anything. And uh, it was fun getting to know both sides of, uh, of Jeff and Colonel Cooper. I, 
think his his uh, his uh, how people thought of him of being a curmud or a curmudgeon or being pompous. They didn't know him. They didn't have the opportunity to sit down and converse with him. Um, he was certainly opinionated, but he could back up what he had to say with factual data, with history, with with uh, the, 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 he was such a voracious reader. He could he could he could support everything he had to say. So it wasn't that. I know this because I am Jeff Cooper, but rather I know this because th this is, is my bibliography uh, to, to explain what, why, why I have this belief. So he was fascinating to talk to about such a wide range of topics. When uh, Jupiter carries a thunderbolt in his hand, well, I, am, I am an inheritor of that legend. <laughs> I grew up with it. I think every boy does. Well, I don't say every boy. Every boy I ever knew did. The idea that you can point and your power rides right out of the end of your arm and touches that over there. Still, still today I get the comment that it must have been great coming up here and have uh, Jeff Cooper teaching you how to shoot. And I will say, well, Jeff uh, improved my shooting, but he didn't teach me how to shoot. What Jeff taught me was how to teach. And that was the big thing that you learned from Jeff Cooper, is how to be an instructor. And I still tell people today, because we'll get people that are Navy SEALs, Marine Recon, and that, that want to get on staff at Gunsight, guys that have got fantastic shooting, uh, competition, and fighting backgrounds. And I go, okay, this is all great, but we're not hiring shooters, we hire instructors. So when people are interested in coming on Gunsight, I said, tell us about your teaching background, because you've got to be able to teach. Challenge to kill a man is a very serious matter. We do not take it lightly. To point your pistol with the skill you already have at a man's chest and squeeze off and blow him away is a difficult thing to do. It's not easy. It is so difficult that a good many people simply die without making it. He knew exactly where he was going and he never wavered from that. And this was a man who could have gone any direction he wanted in life. He didn't have to work, but he totally immersed himself and dedicated himself to the art of pistol craft. It was his sole mission in life. And I've always admired that, that he could have just taken it easy. He didn't have to work that hard. He literally worked at the seven days a week his whole life. He also, Another lesson I learned from Jeff is you have to surround yourself with good people and he did that. He had some really, really super instructors up there. I mean, I got to meet all kinds of good people. I mean, really smart, um, very well educated, people that were very dedicated and devoted to the science of pistol craft. Uh, history is almost the uh, account of man's wars and I'm a history buff and if you read history, you read about war, whether you like it or not. I happen to, rather to like it because I think it is a, a nexus of man's most powerful uh, drives, as Patton is said to have said, uh, watching a, an attack mass. Look, compared to that, every other human endeavor is trivial. He had an amazing system. I still use that basic system to this day, and so does every other teaching school in America. They still, everything is based on what Jeff Cooper did back in the mid-70s. There have been three men in my life that have been a huge influence. Obviously, one is my dad. Um, I, Jeff Cooper definitely would be number two. I mean, Jeff gave me a love for freedom, for the Constitution. I knew nothing about that. When I was raised in South Africa, you were basically um, brainwashed from the time you started school that the government was all powerful, the government was all right, and you never ever questioned what the government said. And it wasn't until I'd lived here and come under Jeff's influence that I realized I was nothing but a robot for the South African government and it really, really annoyed the hell out of me. And so I really embraced the whole concept of freedom and our constitution, which is the most amazing document. And I've become very, very politically active and it's all because of Jeff. I mean, he opened my eyes to a whole new world. Jeff, if the one thing Jeff did bigger than anything else was he made me a free man, and I mean free in my heart because a government cannot make you free. You have to make you free. And I learned that from Jeff.
And that wraps up part one of the history of Gunsight. Gunsight Academy really is where it all started. Can't stress enough the importance of understanding Jeff Cooper, his legacy, his writings, and what he was trying to impart on the students. It all really did come from Jeff. Many, many instructors owe their debt to Jeff. He paved the way. I mean, that's, that's I guess, the best way to put it. He, he paved the way for all the modern instructors out there today to get out there and teach. Because prior to Gunsight, there really was no place for civilians to go and learn how to shoot, learn how to defend themselves. You simply bought a gun and went to the range. There was no modern technique. So it's very important to understand the, the, the history. Uh, it's important to understand the background. In part two of the history of Gunsight, we're gonna start right off with Jeff Cooper's selling Gunsight, the dark years, and when the new current owner stepped in and essentially saved the day, Buzz Mills. You're going to like this story. Thank you for listening to the Make Ready with the Experts podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at makeready.tv and check out our online library of training content you can't get anywhere else. If you like this episode, please be sure to subscribe, share, and give us a review. We would appreciate your feedback. Patio.